Hello, it's John Heaton. Today I'm going to review or re-review an album which is approaching its 50th anniversary. Um, can you guess? <laughs> well, it's in the title of the video. So it's Bad Fingers Ass album, which is coming up for 50 years on the 26th of November 1973 in the US for some strange reason, which I can explain a bit later, not released till the 8th of March 1974. That's a big gap. So they were going through problems with their management. They were deciding whether to stay with Apple or leave Apple. And this was to turn out to be their last Apple album. Um, just, just before I start, there's a couple of other anniversaries today. Obviously today is 55 years since the White Album was released and 60 years since with the Beatles. And also 60 years since JFK was shot and 60 years tomorrow since Doctor Who started anyway. We're not here to celebrate those or, or to, to commemorate those anniversaries. We're, we're here to talk about Bad Fingers. So this is my copy signed by Joey Molland in Liverpool in 1993 when I had the pleasure of meeting him uh, at the, Le the Beatles convention with my friend Will Turner. Um, and we spent a good evening together after his show just drinking beer with him and his brother and a couple of his mates and me and Will and I got him to sign virtually all of my Bad Finger albums. This is a US copy, I believe. This is the inner sleeve. Um, I'm not sure which pressing this is, Jacksonville or Winchester, but it's a US pressing for sure. Uh, I have to say, one thing to say, that the cover is pretty terrible, wouldn't you agree? I mean, it's, it's funny because it's designed by a guy called Peter Coruston, who went on to do some great album covers like Physical Graffiti, Led Zeppelin, Some Girls from the Rolling Stones, and Tattoo You from the Rolling Stones. But this, the idea was that Badfinger had been handed a carrot, sort of sort of golden handshake inducement to sign, well, with Apple in the early days, and then more recently they were getting off, they were getting tempted to leave Apple and, and sign with Warner Brothers for a big fat, sum of money which ended up not materializing but that's a different subject for another video but um so that's the idea behind it but apart from the fact about the double entendre of the word ass it's it's just not a good cover in my opinion um and the, at least the booklet the cd booklet had a few nice pictures here of the band and that could have been the, the inner sleeve that those pictures of uh, Pete and Tom and then Joey and Mike there. That could have been the inner sleeve much better. Instead, they went with the the yawning ass picture, which, uh, yeah, I don't know what they were thinking. It's a slightly better back cover because there's a good shot of the band there in 73, uh, um, smiling away. So anyway, that, so that's the cover. Um, and what happened is after Straight Up, which had been produced by Todd Rundgren, who'd taken over from George Harrison and Jeff Emmerich, who'd earlier done the early sessions, um, that would have been a superbly produced album. And Todd Rundgren got started on a new album with the band. And then a Rolling Stone review came out, slagging off Straight, straight Up. And the band took it very personally and sort of parted ways with Todd Rundgren shortly thereafter. I'm not sure if the two events were connected, but um, they were very upset with this review in Rolling Stone, which with hindsight is ridiculous. I mean, it, was, it wasn't even praising the songs, it was just saying the whole thing was a bit of a disconnected mess. Uh, go check it out if you want to see how bad it is. But uh, um, so, th so basically they were feeling a bit unloved by Apple because Apple was kind of dwindling. Uh, they had the solo Beatles still going strong, but other than that, you know, Mary Hopkin had stopped recording and uh, Jackie Lomax had not, was not having hits and none of the others, Billy Preston had not, I think he'd left the label by this stage and there was, Badfinger were about the only artists left on Apple. I mean, I think there were a couple of others, but um, so they were feeling a bit disillusioned. But I think if Apple had offered them the chance to stay, they probably would have stayed even for less money because Pete Ham was very upset when they did actually leave Apple and they got induced away by Warner Brothers and Stan Polly, the, the uh, infamous business manager of theirs who, who screwed them into the ground and, and led to the unfortunate death of Pete Ham and later Tom Evans. Um, just a terrible guy and I have a good word to say. You think Aaron, Alan Klein's bad, Stan Polly makes Alan Klein look great. Um, 
just an out and out crook from the word go didn't do any no redeeming features at all from what i can see anyway uh, not helped um, unfortunately i was reading this superb bad finger book which is the definitive book on bad finger if you want it written by dan matelvina who unfortunately recently passed away but i i was reading the the background to this album and basically they you know were feeling unloved saying you know we'd had a, we'd had four hits so we expected a bit of you know money of the money we'd made from those hits to be reinvested in the band and the sound and their equipment and stuff and it wasn't so they felt a bit sort of unloved by that and that, but then not helped by the fact they went into the recording studio and to record us um what was to become us and um two problems they they decided to produce themselves so in Mike Gibbons words there were four four people each trying to produce and each saying I want it louder here I want it softer there and so it was a bit of a disaster and the actual original tapes were rejected by Apple and they do the original album if you ask me sounds a bit a bit of a mess production wise Chris Thomas was brought in to salvage it um but it's just noticeably less well produced than straight up and and no dice for that matter um another contributing factor to the uh the poor sound or the poor results of the sessions would be that that Mike Mike Gibbon said that they they went to the studio to record the album but they ended up just eating hash cakes and getting getting high so no doubt they had a good time but uh didn't do much for the music and i don't think they concentrated on the music enough so the this first lineup of of the album had a few songs in it like piano red from Pete which is a kind of blues parody and I was listening to that yesterday and it's pretty bad I'm glad they didn't release that um there were a couple of other tracks they were trying to record like dreaming from Joey and rock and roll from Tom they they're pretty substandard as well just rock and roll numbers really um but Joey Molland was was coming to the fore here as a songwriter and he would actually eventually end up writing five tracks out of the 10 on the album um and including and on top of that there's a couple of outtakes from Joey one of which made the CD here do you mind which is a very high quality and there's another track called regular he's irregular which is about you know going down the pub and being and, and it's a very funny song and apparently Joey had to drink half a bottle of whiskey before he sang that um and that that could have lightened the mood of the album because it is quite a somber album um but having said that the main well I'll come to the I'll come to the um track listing in a minute but I just want to say on online if you go into the Gilux as 2010 remaster set on Spotify you've got a lot of bonus tracks more than a, 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 appeared on the CD so on the CD you've got bonus um alternate tracks of um Apple of my eye blind owl timeless and then you've got regular and do you mind as bonus tracks as well well online you've got alternative versions of get away when i say the winner i can love you as well as, as well as the ones i just mentioned and they're not particularly not a huge difference in the sound but very interesting to hear i particularly enjoyed the alternative version of the winner and the alternative version of get away you know that these are tracks which chris thomas did a good rescue job on and they sound pretty good they sound much better remastered um in 2010 than they did on the original vinyl release and I just want to point you to this is my son's copy which he he got signed by Joey Molland in Liverpool last year at the Beatles convention and this is the 90s reissue um and it says on the back that bonus track do you mind so I was looking at the the vinyl this is the sleeve notes from Andy Davis record collector and I was looking at the sleeve note I was looking at the vinyl This is a U- UK Apple, um all the albeit slightly lighter than the normal Apple that you would see in the UK or maybe not for the mid 70s but certainly lighter than the Abbey Road Apple for example. Um but I was looking at the the grooves on side 2 and and counting the tracks and saying well it doesn't look as if the bonus track is on there. So I I put, stuck it on the turntable and sure enough side 2 ends with timeless and do you mind is nowhere to be seen. So I think it's a bit of a cheat. Tell me whether I've got the wrong copy of maybe I've got a 70s copy inside the 90s sleeve in which case that that's pretty bad. But um I paid 15 quid for this. Uh 
Uh, tell me if your copy, if you have a copy of the 90s ass, if your copy is missing, do you mind on the vinyl? Because I think that's pretty sloppy if that's the case. Oh dear. Um, so, where are we? So let's, uh, this album didn't do well commercially. I can't believe it didn't, but they did leave a long gap between Straight Up, which had come out in the early weeks of 72, or December 71, I can't quite remember. And they'd left this until November 73. That's a big gap in the 70s when people were turning out album, an album a year or expected to. Certainly if you were trying to maintain a momentum and particularly in the US, they, they had a good name in the US. They had hit singles behind them and they left it um, more than 18 months to release a follow-up to Straight Up. So I don't think that was in their favor and it only struggled 122 in the US charts and didn't even chart in the UK. But having said that, fans like this album and have a soft spot for it because it's their last album on Apple. It's one of the last albums released on Apple other than the solo Beatles. I think it's the last one in my collection anyway. Um, and as to the song material, well, the first thing one notices is Pete Ham is a little bit thin on the ground in terms of the songs he's coming up with. The piano red one I mentioned is dismissible. And he comes up with only two, the opener and the closer of this album, Apple of My Eye, which is a lovely tribute to the Apple label that he was leaving um, and very heartfelt lyrics, I'm sure genuine. And then, so that's a nice tune, not very well produced, I have to say, uh, a little bit clunky and muddy in the production. And then Timeless ends the album. A sort of gorgeous sort of philosophical number from Pete with a lovely guitar solo. Um, but the words are a little bit kind of basic and uh, I don't know what the word is, they're a little bit, um, twee, shall we say, if I'm being harsh, and, and uh, the fade out goes on too long. You know, they're trying to do a kind of white noise, um, I want you, she's so heavy kind of fade out, and it goes, goes on a minute too long, um, and it's not very effective. But, but having said that, there's some great musicianship on the album, guitar work, and I like the way the piano comes in on the second verse. Um, so it's a strong song, it just could have been produced and, and shortened a bit, produced better and shortened a bit. Anyway, Joey then contributes the next track, Get Away, which is a storming rocker in which he was reading. I was reading in Dan's book, he actually plays piano on that, which is very interesting. It's a kind of basically rock and roll boogie track, but, and basically saying, because Pete Ham used to spend all of his day working and all of the night recording and, and writing new songs. And, um, you know, Joey was saying, um, you may be right working all night and day, but I know sometimes I have to get away. So that was his, his re reply to Pete, you know, I, I'm quite happy to play the guitar when I want to and write songs when I want to, but there are also times when I want to just go down the pub or relax. And so that's an effective song. Um, Icicles is a sort of late addition to the album and very nice sort of um, psychedelic song from Joey with lovely guitar work. And the winner is a very strong number. I was playing this loud yesterday. Uh, check this one out if you haven't heard it. It's um, apparently the words were aimed at John Lennon because it was at the, at the time when John Lennon was complaining about everything in, in his political phase, and you know Joey Molland got a bit pissed off that he was complaining about everything because he was a millionaire, blah blah. You know that kind of debate. And some of the words, if you listen, are maybe slightly aimed at John, but um, they're sufficiently generic. That doesn't have to mean that. It could be it could mean other things. And they're quite clever words. Chris Thomas, I was reading, was quite impressed with Joey's lyrics. They're quite satirical and quite amusing as well. Um, so that's a great track, The Winner, with great guitar solo. I'm not sure who plays it, Pete or Joey, because they alternated. Um, Blind Owl from Tommy, very strong contribution to Endside One, kind of bluesy number. Uh, Tommy was not coming up with a lot of songs at this stage either. And he only contributes two songs to the album. Pete only contributes two. And then the others are all from Joey, apart from one from Mike. So, but Blind Owl is a strong song from, from Tom. And they played this one a lot live in concert. And then you turn over to side two. And we've got Constitution, which is a kind of heavy, sort of Jimi Hendrix type number, a bit reminiscent of Helter Skelter um, from Joey. And... Uh, um, you know, basic lyrics about, you know, it's not my way of life, you know, I'm just a lover for my wife. Um, but, you know, very effective guitar work and very heavy rhythm section. And this album actually is quite coherent in terms of Badfinger presenting a kind of heavier sound with the harmonies still present, albeit not quite as present as they had been on Straight Up and No Dice or Magic Christian. But um, they actually found their kind of 
unique groove and they, they weren't sounding like Beatles copyists anymore, which had been the case a little bit up to, up to this stage. And Bud Scopper in Rolling Stone, I was reading his review of the album, is quite complimentary about this album. He said, if it, I would call it a return to form were it not more obviously an introduction to the band Beneath the Veneer, which I thought was quite a good comment. Uh, when I Say is a lovely ballad from Tom written after he'd had an argument with his wife Marianne, I think, um, and it's a song which he was fond of and I think Marianne is fond of and we're all fond of. It's a great tune, very heartfelt. And then Cowboy is a delightful song from Mike and much needed um, bit of humour here to lighten the mood because the, the subject matter of the rest of the album is dark, dark, dark. And then you've got Mike just saying, hey, cowboy, it's up to you to try to make it home today. Um, uh, and I've known you well enough to say, yeah, yeah, it's just great guitar solo in the middle. I know Mike was saying he did a better version of, his, of the song with his Welsh mates, but I haven't heard that version. I was trying to look for it. Haven't heard it, so I couldn't compare. But uh, I think the band do a good version. Nice, nice kind of guitar work from. I suppose it's Pete. Could be Joey. Um, so I love that one. I'd give that one ten out of ten. Actually, it might be my favourite on the album. Then I can love you as a as a track. There's a couple of tracks produced by Tog Rungren left over from either the Straight Up sessions or immediately after the Straight Up sessions, where he's credited as producer, the winner, and I can love you. And um, someone was saying that they left Joey's vocal very high in the mix and he doesn't quite have the same sort of soft tones, vocal tones as Pete and Tom. But uh, he sings it very passionately and it's a nice song and nicely produced and a pretty, pretty decent number. And then we've got Timeless to end the album. So that was the end of that. Um, just want to say also on Spotify, you can check out some Pete Ham. Uh, unreleased stuff it just appeared on Spotify this year. There's one album in particular of interest called Misunderstood, where it's got some of his tracks he, he recorded towards the end, like No, Don't Let It Go, uh, and, it, and it doesn't really matter in Helping Hand, where they've added instrumentation, like someone's added a drum and a bass. And um, it's very interesting to hear because they sound more like finished tracks, which is, which is great. Um, just what we need, really. Um, so that was that. So that was this was ass. Um, a nice uh, way to leave the label, although a bit sad. And we know what happened when they joined Warner Brothers. Although they did release two decent albums, it didn't end well for them. But that's probably the subject for another video. So thanks for watching this one. See you next time.